Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Just a quick few short thank yous before we get uh, before we get started. I want to thank um, I want to thank the good of West Rogers Park for hosting us. Um, Rabbi Scheinberg um, was gracious enough to allow us to use the shul, um, and he is here this morning. And of course, um, Avrami and Roy Weinfeld, who made sure that everything was set up and taken care of. We also have an amazing host committee. Um, I don't see Bruce Leon yet, but I, I know that he's coming. Um, David Parsh gave up baseball today to be here. Uh, Sham Shimaskowitz, Michael Nadell, um, Svi Reifer, Ruben Stein, you all have worked very hard to make sure that um, you have people here. And uh, there's a few other names that I did not mention because they did not want to be mentioned, but I thank you all, you know who you are. Um, of course, our staff that put this together, um, Ellie Newmark, Julie Getter for the delicious food, uh, Rabbi Ehrman, and my assistant, Lani Shapiro, thank you very much. And, um, and then, of course, most of all, we would like to thank um, Representative Yichiel Kalish and uh, Ramba Lavalm, who will soon be here. Um, thank you very much for giving of your time on a Sunday uh, to be here with us to engage. I just want to just lay out exactly what we're trying to do this morning and what the format's going to be. Um, you know, people are very cynical about politicians, but I can tell you firsthand that um, the majority of them, um, and for sure ours, that's for sure, are very, very hardworking, and we don't appreciate that because we don't see them, because for, for such a large time, they're away from their families and away from the community, down in Springfield, working often through weekends, day and night, and, um, and we, don't, we, we don't appreciate what they're doing, and then when we, read, we see a sound bite or a headline in the newspaper, we get upset and cynical, so instead of saying thank you, we get, you know, we get angry and we may talk to the guy next to us in shul by Kiddush and say, you know, what's going on? Over so it's important for us to understand and appreciate what they're doing. Um, so I would like to give them an opportunity to explain what they've been fighting for and doing for our community um, that we should be grateful for, and also to address questions, and perhaps more importantly, to clarify if there are concerns, questions in the community, people should know. It's very complex how the sausage is made, so to speak, in Springfield. And in order to get what you need, compromises have to be made, things are taken out of context, it's important that your questions are addressed. So if you look on the center of your tables, there are index cards with pens. And I'm going to ask you if you have questions that you plan to ask today. I will be moderating. Please write down those questions. I'll be going around taking cards and reading those questions. Now, it could be that sometime in the middle, you'll have a question will be addressed, and you'll have a follow-up question. You, didn't, you don't have time to write it down. Raise your hand and uh, we'll try to get to you and, and give you a chance to ask that question live. I'll try to repeat the question if, it, if, I, if I think people didn't hear it clearly, but um, preferably if the questions are on the card so that we can do it in a more efficient manner, that would be best. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Representative Kalish for taking, um, taking this Sunday to be here with us. And so without further ado, Representative Yechiel Kalish. Thank you so much, Roshlema. Place from the Chleira like Roshlema mentioned, I'd really like to thank Agudas Yisrael for putting this together. It really means a really means a lot to me to be able to talk to you. You know, Roshlema said that you know we'll have 10, 15 minutes for questions, and uh, I said to him, I'm here all day, and I mean that. Uh, if you have a question, you don't have time to you don't have time for me to get to it uh, or for it to be answered. This is what I do. This is what I'm here for. Uh, I'm available to you um, to answer your question. So uh, that's, uh, that's, I just want to put that out there. I don't want anyone to have a question that's not answered. Um, I want to share with you uh, a Misa uh, that happened. Uh, and there's actually one person in this room who witnessed this. A few years ago, um, I was, uh, I think it was November of 2006, Rabbi Shmuel Bloom got up at the National Oguda Convention and he announced from the podium that Yechiel Kalish would be the National Director of Government Affairs for Oguda Yisrael. So this was, um, this was actually a surprise to my wife who was sitting in the crowd uh, because until that time I had been Midwest Director of you know, Goodis Yisrael, and she hears for the first time that you feel okay, there's be national director of Goodis Yisrael, and she didn't know what that would mean. Are we going to have to move to New York? What's going to happen, etc. 
And that announcement um, put, a, put a large stress on my family. And I wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael and talk to the G'day Tara, get some direction. So Maishi Davis, uh, very kindly, arranged uh, for me to go see several G'day Tara, one of whom was Remichel Yehuda Lefkowitz, the Chayna Lebracha. So Maishi and I were together by Remichel Yehuda, and um, I asked Remichel Yehuda, we've seen so many times how Askonim uh, in Klal Yisrael get involved in a project, and we know that we'd like to see the accomplishment of that project come, you know, start from here and end there. And a lot of times that's what happens. It starts here and ends there. But our approach, how we thought it should happen, it completely doesn't happen the way we thought. Now that we, we have all these plans, we say, oh, we're going to do this, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. None of that happens, but the result happens. So obviously it's pure and total siyat of the Shemaya, right? We came in with the intention of accomplishing a goal that gets accomplished. We know that it wasn't us, because our plan uh, was one thing and it happened a completely different thing. So I said to Rambach Yehuda, take me out of it. Let me go back to learning in Kailo. And someone else could be National Director of Government Affairs for Good as Yisrael, or in this context, someone else could be state representative, uh, you know, and get their head bashed in for RHA, right? So why, why, why do I have to do it? So says Rambach Yehuda Lefkowitz, the following, state and terror. Ela told us Hashemayim ha'aretz bihi barom. This is the creation. Biyayim asayis Hashem alokim eretz Hashemayim. V'chol siyach hasolda terem yeb ha'aretz. And all the vegetation of the field before it's on the earth. V'chol eisev hasolda terem yitzmach. And all the grass of the fields before it sprouts. Ki lehim tir Hashem alokim ha'aretz. Because the Kodesh Baruch Hu had not made it rain yet on the land. V'adam ayin lavedas adam. Zok Rashi, ki loy himtir, it did not rain, umatam loy himtir, asked Rashi, why didn't it rain? Lefisha adam ayin lavay das adama, because man was not there to work the field. Ve in makir betoivason shel geshomim, and he was not there to be makir toiv on the rain. Ukshaba adam. Right? The Yodeya, Shehem Tzarech Le'olem, His Pa'ol Alehem V'yardu. And when man comes, and he can make known, and be known, that it's a Tzarech for the world to have rain, he can daven for them, and they can come down. Says Rav Mufli Yehuda Lefkowitz, only someone involved, only someone who's working behind the scenes, can actually understand the miracles that take place. Only when there was man on this ground, only when there was man in the world who knew it was necessary for it to rain, only that person can truly understand the gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given us. He says, your job and the job of every Askin in this room is to tell the stories. Your job is to make sure people understand the, the incredible siyata d'shmai that takes place because only you can understand you who are involved can understand the miracles that take place. The last, you know, I don't know when we're going to have a chance to write this story, but at some point we're going to write the story of the miracle that, you know, led to my appointment and led to, um, you know, all the different things that took place over the past six months. Uh, it's really, um, you know, as Yitzchok will tell you, Yitzchok Berman will tell you, I was off the radar screen in January of 2019. I was private. I was living a very quiet life. And then the opportunity came to serve again, and uh, Maishi Davis was there again to, you know, uh, to push. And uh, Baruch Hashem, I had this opportunity to work for you the last six months. I think we accomplished a great deal. I know we accomplished a great deal. There's a lot more to accomplish. I have a lot of challenges ahead. You know, I took a very difficult vote, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm happy to discuss and I'm happy to talk about to anyone who wants to hear. 
but that vote is going to be used against me over the next uh, six months, and I need everyone in this room to help push me over because uh, that is really the difference between myself and every other candidate uh, who's going to be running for this office. So um, there's, a, there's so many stories to tell, you know, so many issues that we can cover, and I don't want to take all the time, but I just want to share that one you said with you, uh, the idea that we working behind the scenes truly understand the Siyata Deshmaya, truly understand you know, uh, what God has given us. And um, I also want to really, you know, thank uh, Senator Rahm, who's now here. Uh, you know, Senator Rahm who is, uh, who has been nothing but an advocate uh, on our behalf down in Springfield. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really important uh, to understand that. And uh, I know he's going to get a, a chance to, to speak next, but you know, uh, he came in, and I want to I want to make that acknowledgement. And I also want to acknowledge. I think I saw Alderman Silverstein. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, sitting as was not in there, uh, but uh, you know, uh, everyone give her a round of applause. Thank her for everything uh, uh, she does for us. And of course, um, you know, uh, July Fourth, uh, I had my first opportunity to walk in. Uh, a, a parade. I had attended, and I think I walked like 15 years ago with Lou Lang, uh, a, a, a July 4th parade, but I, I, this was my first time walking a parade, and standing next to me was Barry Bass, and I really want to thank him, you know, for walking that parade with me. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Bass, and, uh, you know, everything you do for Lincoln. So I think, or shall I know that's uh, my, my portion? I think we're good. How do you want to? So I'll just read the question, and then I'll... Okay. Okay. You want to do Senator Rahm first? You want to do yeah, maybe that's a better idea, because yeah. that way there's a lot of these questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm realizing that a lot of these questions are not exclusively um, directed towards any particular, not particularly towards Representative Kalish or Senator Rahm, so I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to call up Senator uh, Rahm Villavalm for a few comments, um, and then we'll move on to the questions. So um, without further ado, Senator Rahm Villavalm. One more note, um, those of you who are submitting questions via the cards, if you could put your name on the card, that would be helpful. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my apologies for, for the, the little, being a little bit late. Uh, my 10-month-old was not cooperating this morning, and uh, I, we had to take care of some things. Uh, I, uh, my name is Ram Vallum. I love the fact that Senator Ram is sticking. There's a reason our website is SenatorRam.com and not SenatorVillyVallum.com. <laughs> There'd be a lot of uh, mis misspelled Google searches, I think. Um, I, uh, I'm proud to be here. I've been in office for six months, having been sworn in in January. Um, this is a refresher. Uh, my district has uh, 217,000 people, has 21 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, going from Montrose Avenue past Devon, Lincolnwood, all of Lincolnwood. Um, hi, Mary, Mayor Bass. Um, two thirds of uh, Skokie, uh, Niles, uh, Morton Grove, Glenview, and Unincorporated Displains. It's great to be here with uh, Representative Kalish, Alderman Silverstein, as well. Um, we uh, we had a pretty busy session, uh, and I'll tell a couple stories. You know, one, um, you know, we uh, and I just caught the tail end of Representative Kalish's uh, remarks, but uh, talking about behind the scenes. Um, you know, if we did a, we talk about polling, if we did a poll of, uh, you know, what people think happens um, on the House and Senate floor, I, I don't know what the poll would be, uh, but uh, there's so much that goes into it, and uh, the story that I have is um, particular to the Capitol bill, and, um, you know, Senator, I was, I'm Vice Chairman of Transportation, and um, uh, was on the Joint Subcommittee of uh, Capital Needs that traveled the state. And Senator uh, Marty Sandoval and Senator Andy Menar, um, they represent the southwest side of Chicago and the uh, and Springfield area, respectively. Um, they were kind of leading this effort for our caucus in the Senate. And I went to them, you know, four or five days before session ended, May 25th. And I said, so is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? I mean, this, we're, we're talking about, you know, this has been talked about. I mean, for God's sakes, I've traveled as part of this joint subcommittee to to Cater, to Edwardsville, to uh, um, uh, Peoria, 
Uh, and so, you know, we put all this effort in, is this gonna happen? Is this gonna come together? And both of them, no, 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 no way. No way, this is not gonna happen. There's not enough time to appropriate the spending. Keep in mind, these are people that have been there for 20 years. Um, and they've dealt with the last capital bill. They've dealt with budgets, et cetera. And, um, and so finally, I, I said, okay, it's not gonna happen. But you know, we still had everything prepared that we needed to prepare uh, in case it did. And Friday night, um, there was a um, series of things that happened, uh, May 31st, and uh, there was one chamber, not the Senate, uh, that needed some extra time, uh, the House. Uh, Given uh, Representative Kalish a little hard time here. But uh, they needed some extra time. So we got left the Capitol at 1.30 in the morning uh, the Senate did and said we'll come back. We'll figure out what the House is going to do tomorrow on Saturday, June 1st um, and um, We'll come back, you know the next week and we'll finish finish up and the negotiations in the House were going on on the Capitol bill and a couple other things, but mainly the Capitol bill and um, And so I go and I you know had been thinking about it all day because I had made a commitment to speak uh, at an event in downtown Chicago at 930 in the morning so we got out of the Capitol at 1.30, went to the hotel, slept for three hours, um, then got up and drove. Um, and as I was reaching my destination to, to, to speak, um, you know, I called my wife. It was 8 a.m. and I had been gone for five nights. And uh, you know, I just wanted to check in and maybe give her a little bit of a heads up that I might have to go back on Sunday. So I called her uh, and I said, how's it going? And she's with, she was with our, I guess, eight month old at the time. And um, we were chit-chatting, and I said, I'll be home around noon, and I'll be able to help. And, and, um, and then I said, well, I might have to go back on Sunday. There was a, I don't know, 10-second pause. Uh, it felt like 20 minutes. Uh, and then she had some very choice words. Uh, and then she said, who do I need to talk to down there for this to be done? Uh, and. Uh, you know, I said, look, it, this is a process, you know, you tried to explain. And, and so um, my point is that we had to go back on Sunday and I'm glad we did uh, because we ended up finishing the most historic session that we've had in decades. Um, and I'll be the first to say, not every piece of legislation was perfect. Uh, no piece of legislation is. There's, you know, every session there's 6,000 bills that are introduced. Only 599 have went to the governor, passed both chambers, and there's a reason for that. There's only 10% that have gone because there are certain bills that aren't ready to, to see the finish line. And even the ones that are, um, you know, we have to take time and understand, um, you know, uh, what the implementation will be, how it will look. There's going to be uh, some things that we need to tweak and fix. Uh, and so um, I'm just uh, really uh, proud to have been part of that effort. Uh, I'm here to talk and answer any questions I can. Uh, I want this to be more of a dialogue than, um, than uh, um, uh, me just talking. And you know, we can talk about the capital bill, fair tax, um, and, and other issues. Um, you know, one one last story I'll tell is, um, you know, I have a lot of hope for this state, and and um, the reason that I have that hope is, um, you know, I actually for a number of reasons, but. June, Friday, June 28th, um, I participated in what's called Adopt a Legislator Program. Um, you know, uh, so basically the Illinois Farm Bureau came out to my office and they said, hey, you're a city of Chicago legislator, you're from Cook County, you may not know, and nice, nicely they said, you may not know a lot about agriculture. Agriculture is the number one industry in the state of Illinois. And they said, we have this program where you can, um, you know, you can uh, kind of learn more, and it's, we, we, had, we have counties downstate that adopt a legislator. So I said, yes, sign me up. And um, so I went down to Monroe County. I brought my wife and my, my son. Uh, my wife, you know, we drove five hours there, and on the way there, she looked at me and said, this is not a vacation, this doesn't count. Um, <laughs> and uh, and we, had a, we had a long day, um, but, uh, I've, I've learned so much. I learned so much about uh, farming and uh, the flooding that they're experiencing down there, and um, you know how they feel as downstate versus you know where we are. And you know what gives me hope was, you know, as a, as a legislator, I have responsibility to, um, even though I represent this district, 
I have responsibility to kind of assess how things are going to impact um, the entire state. Um, what, what struck me though when, when, they, when they asked me to join this program is um, they, uh, they said they would come up. They said they would come up to our district. And so these four or five rural farmers um, whose lives are completely different from us, whose politics and policies are somewhat different, um, they're going to come up. And for me, that gives me hope because then I, they asked me, show us what your district um, needs. Show us how, what, what issues um, your, your district is impacted by. And, and that gives me hope because we get to talk about um, the threats of anti-Semitism, hate crimes, the diversity that our district has, the fact that we have a mosque, synagogue, temple, and church all on the same street. Uh, and I think um, the more that we can have that exchange, the better that we're going to be as a state and the more that we can accomplish. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. I, um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions and go from there. And I, just want, to, I want to add, you know, I appreciated what Representative Kaler said. Um, it's been great to have him as a partner in the State House. Um, we, were, we were able to, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, sausage making, as they say, uh, we were able to coordinate on some of the capital funding uh, that we were able to get for, for this district. And uh, it was a lot of, uh, we got our steps in that day. We had, we had a lot of back and forth between each chamber to figure out who was giving what. And so um, it, it's great to have, have you as a partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll just, before I ask the first question, I just want to make one observation that both our state senator and our state representative, it's their first, uh, they're both considered what's freshmen. It's their first um, term in serving in, in the state legislature. And usually it takes time before a legislator is able to actually get things done. And it's remarkable that they were able to do so much for the district and just, you know, they're, they just hit the ground running right away. So uh, they, they may have been termed officially freshmen, but they were, they did not, if they were rookies, they were rookie of the years. So, um, okay. First question from um, Ellie Schreiber, Eli Schreiber. Uh, forgive me if I didn't, if I mispronounced the name. What do you see as the biggest challenges you will be facing come election time, and how can we strongly support you? So, <clears throat> it's a good question, uh, uh, Eli. So. Uh, Strongly supporting, make sure everyone pulls Democratic uh, ballot when they go vote, uh, because I'm only going to be on the Democratic ballot. And uh, you know, so people have to register, go to the polls, and pull the Democratic ballot. So that's that is number one uh, in terms of supporting me or Senator Rom. Uh, Rom's not running this uh, this term; he's he's got a four-year, uh, so he's he's lucky. Um, but uh, that's uh, I hack I happen to think that's going to be my greatest challenge. Um, because, uh, you know, it, it, I need every vote uh, in this district uh, as possible. You know, we went, uh, we, had a, we had a great uh, team meeting uh, together with, uh, you know, the leaders of the Democratic Party, and uh, they looked at uh, the different uh, voting patterns in our district. It's really quite scary, uh, you know, the level of detail uh, that they have. And uh, they laid out for us that our biggest challenge is making sure that um, you know, the identifiable members of our community uh, go out, uh, register, vote, and pull that Democratic ballot. So that's, uh, for me, 100% the biggest challenge. You know, they say that Americans produce a people that will go across oceans to fight for democracy, but they won't cross the street to vote for democracy. So you have to make sure to, to go vote. Okay, the next question, um, it does not have a name on it. Um, we've heard about this capital bill. Can you tell us what is being done in our area that will benefit our community? Uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, news about the capital bill. Obviously, um, the governor signed it the last week of June, actually, the, uh, as I was heading down to Monroe County. Um, so, a couple things. One is it's, it was a $45 billion capital bill, uh, $30 billion for horizontal, uh, which is roads, bridges, and mass transit. Um, the, Amer the American uh, Society of Civil Engineers has rated uh, Illinois, the state of Illinois, uh, a D rating when it comes to our transportation and infrastructure. 
Uh, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce put out a study, um, of, you know, the business group put out a study that says motorists are spending um, uh, $4.8 billion annually on uh, wear and tear. Uh, we have over 2,300 deficient bridges in the state of Illinois. Uh, so when I was at a capital hearing, um, and we have the Illinois Department of Transportation in front of us, and they say there's a bridge, the scale is one to nine, and this bridge is at a two, um, you know, somewhat, you know, facetiously, it's like, when do you shut it down, when it's negative one? Uh, and, and, and so we had a real responsibility um, to take action and uh, avoid, quite frankly, what happened in Minnesota when there was a bridge that collapsed and, and 13 people and 145 were injured. Uh, 30 people died, 145 were injured. So uh, we made significant investment. Uh, we we uh, raised the gas tax and did a couple other pieces of revenue um, to uh, improve our roads, bridges, and mass transit. Um, the second piece of that was the vertical. Um, which is, you know, buildings for, uh, you know, uh, improving universities, hospitals, also uh, community improvements, nonprofits, and, and whatnot. Um, that was uh, helped paid for by um, the gaming legislation uh, that passed. Um, and so uh, these are just broad strokes, but uh, I think we had to do what we had to do um, to move our, our state in the right direction, keep our residents safe, help attract businesses here. Um, the, the the horizontal rev, the horizontal capital part the roads bridges and mass transit it's sustainable moving forward uh, so we don't have to come, keep coming back and, and being in this situation um, as far as what what it does for our community one uh, on the horizontal front um, the city of Chicago will get uh, a lump sum from the state uh, as it relates to um, you know sort of transportation infrastructure and so uh, as as I have 21 neighbors in the city of Chicago, the 39th Ward, the 50th Ward, 41st, 41st Ward, um, we'll have to go out and advocate to the city of Chicago that we have to prioritize um, these projects here. Um, and then, with along with the vertical, or along with that, so that's horizontal. Vertical for our community, uh, each state representative and each state senator uh, had an allotment um, that they got in terms of member initiative funds, and so we were able to allocate uh, resources between Representative Kalish and I, um, I believe for five or so um, uh, Jewish organizations in this district, Hatzalah, The Ark, um, Chicago has a fund, Chicago Torah has a fund, and uh, Ali. The, the, the Simcha Hall. The, the Simcha Hall right? Well, there's a number. We'll get you a list. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, um, we were proud to do that, and that was one of the items that we had to kind of walk back and forth between the House and Senate to talk about because we wanted to maximize our resources. Um, you know, um, Representative Kalish got an allotment, I got an allotment, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were making the most of it. So, uh, again, in short, um, improving our local roads, um, uh, making sure that uh, any transit improvements that we can have, and we want to work with, obviously, the aldermen on that. Um, locally uh, is important and then when it comes to vertical um, helping those uh, community organizations continuing to pro provide the services that they have been yeah, yeah it's just to uh, add a little bit uh, more specific first of all you know uh, senators right I mean uh, one, the di one of the differences between the house and the Senate is that um, to walk on the Senate floor, if you're a male, for some reason, I think you have to be wearing a tie. Yeah. <laughs> so today it's pretty funny that I'm wearing the tie and you're not. <laughs> we have to wear a tie and jacket on the Senate floor. Tie and jacket, right. Tie and jacket, the House has no such rules. You just have to, uh, you know, uh, you just have to wear your badge. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, we were uh, going back and forth. And that was something, you know, Senator Rahm and I just, uh, just said a few minutes ago, how um, you know we both had experience in Springfield before we had this uh, position, and when the Capitol bill you know started to become more of a reality, uh, unlike other freshmen, we were on it. Um, we, we had really been talking about it for weeks leading up to it, and we were on it. We wanted to make sure that you know 50th Ward got the $750,000 you know that uh, that you're going to get, uh, you know, so that we could do those uh, those lights and. 
uh, you know, other, other projects. I sat down uh, with the members of the Han Hala from Agudas Yisrael. You know, we went through, you know, different projects for the community. The Simcha Hall, which is going to get, like, somewhere between six and seven hundred thousand dollars. The, 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 the Chicago Chesed Fund, which is going to get around four to five, four to five hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, other, other different types of projects, you know, that are going to uh, receive, uh, you know, uh, funds from this capital bill to have, you know, a disproportionate impact and, you know, have, uh, make, make lives better. Very interesting, you know, one of the things that happened towards the end of the process, you know, as I was talking to my leadership, um, was that they had told us, you know, not to, quote unquote, specify monies to municipalities. Um, and uh, I had seen others do so, and I was told not to because there would be an opportunity later. So we are still working um, on several projects for Lincolnwood, and I want to I want to point that out because Mayor Bass is here. Um, we are still working on several projects for Wink Lincolnwood uh, for uh, the, the horizontal uh, aspect of it. Uh, they're doing a great job over there. I don't know if you're seeing what's going on by the Purple Hotel. Uh, what used to be the Purple Hotel area. That whole redevelopment. Uh, what they're doing over there is amazing, and we're hoping that some of uh, the funds uh, that are still undesignated. Uh, we'll go to assist them uh, in that effort. Um, and uh, we're also, you know, again, not many, many people here are from Skokie, but Skokie happens to have uh, Crawford Road. Um, again, these are some of the things you learn when you're a state legislator. Crawford Road uh, from Devon all the way up to Maine, which is in my district, uh, happens to be, you know, it looks like it went through Baghdad. Uh, and uh, it really is, 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 is a real danger. One of, one of the real problems in fixing that road is there's no parking um, on Crawford. So a lot of the residents, while they want work to be done and they want the street to be fixed, the expense at necessary to do one side than the other side, I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare. Uh, so between the, the money that we're trying to get for Lincolnwood, the money we're trying to get Skokie, the money that we've gotten for the uh, city of Chicago, uh, I think, you know, uh, I think I know, uh, we did very well for, for the district and um, hopefully uh, you'll all uh, be able to see it soon. Indeed, we are very, <clears throat> excuse me, we are very grateful for um, what you've done and on the Capitol Bill you know, really bring home some important initiatives and, uh, and funding and projects for our community. Okay, this qu question is from Pesach. Pesach, do you want to raise your hand to identify yourself? Okay, Pesach has two questions. Uh, what is your policy regarding school vouchers, and what will you do regarding the growing problem of refugees in our city? <laughs> I'm, I'm the Senate, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I, um, so uh, those are both great questions. So uh, one, um, with regards to school vouchers, that's an issue that I've talked to many of you about, uh, you know, as, especially as it relates to the scholarship tax credit. I've visited, uh, I don't know, alley 10 or so Jewish day schools uh, in the, over the last year. Uh, and I've learned a lot. You know, my position uh, was and has been, uh, I've been, I've been fundamentally opposed to uh, drawing dollars away from uh, public education. And um, there's an argument to be made that, that school vouchers does that. Uh, that being said, I've learned a lot and I've learned how important the scholarship tax credit is to um, this community and uh, my district. And I say that because, um, you know, one of the things that I tell people is, you know, during the election, uh, we have a job to do and we have to win an election. But after the election, we represent all 217,000 people in my district and 108 in his. Uh, and so, it's an issue that I want to keep engaging um, uh, everyone on and continuing to learn. So, um, you know, please uh, let me know, um, you know, your perspective, and we'd love to have that conversation. Um, as it relates to refugees, uh, we there's a lot of uh, discussion when it comes to uh, immigration at this point. Uh, we um, you know, we're we're kind of in a situation where uh, the federal government has has um, made its made its intentions, made its position clear, and uh, we're trying to do everything we can as a state of Illinois to uh, be welcoming, um, treat immigrants uh, the way we would want to be treated, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, I don't know the, the exact solution, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to be welcoming. Um, we need to enact policies, both at the city and state level, um, to reflect that. 
the challenges uh, are many, though. Uh, once getting, you know, allowing them to be here, but making sure there's language access, making sure there's housing, making sure that um, they have uh, a pathway to a job. Um, these are all um, items that we have to work on um, collectively, and uh, that's something that I think there's no one simple answer to that, and we have to continue to, to work on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree on that last statement uh, as it relates to immigrants and refugees, um, and uh, I think that uh, it's a it's a humanitarian crisis as well. We have to we have to be very careful uh, how we uh, how we handle Thank this uh, this situation. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of good people here, um, and uh, listen as it relates to the school vouchers. You know, I'm the school choice rabbi, so I mean that's uh, you know that's a uh, that's, that's an easy one for me in this crowd. Um, but I will tell you, as, as it relates to um, understanding my district more, I think one of the things that I learned um, after becoming a state representative, listen, you know, when I was running a good so I, 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 I had a small uh, constituency that I was focusing on. But now I really represent 108,000 people. And, um, you know, our community size, if we're generous in our numbers, is 9,000. So, right, so the, the far majority um, of our uh, community uh, and the people who have children send their children to public schools. So uh, part of my education has been um, understanding the needs of the public schools, working with the Illinois Education Association, working with the <coughs> Illinois Federation of Teachers, working with the Chicago Teacher Union, um, and understanding uh, their positions, their needs. I, I think I was an a, I think I was an A plus on every one of their uh, issues. Um, this year because I came to their side and I understood what it was uh, that was important to them. At the same time, uh, I sit on a very uh, interesting committee. Um, one of the committees that I sit on is um, the, uh, an education committee that focuses on licensing and charters. Uh, and what was, what's interesting about the makeup of that committee is that committee has eight members. It has uh, five Democrats and three Republicans. Uh, when they put me on that committee, uh, I, I don't think they were expecting uh, that I would be the swing vote on all charter-related issues uh, as it came to, uh, to the state. Um, and that has allowed uh, me to further understand uh, the issues and challenges that charters and school choice uh, community is facing, um, the issues and challenges that the public schools are facing. I'm getting real good face time with their, uh, with their lobbyists and their advocates. And I will tell you that the, the public school advocates um, are really doing a very good job uh, and uh, really trying to make sure that the, those schools are well funded because we really need to make sure that those schools are funded uh, first and foremost. So that's really important the thing that uh, everyone should understand. So we'll take turns. Um, who goes first so that, um, because when it comes to seniority, like I said, we're dealing with uh, um, two very accomplished freshmen. Um, now, there seems to be a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to condense it into one question. Yuri Hollander, um, and I'm going to just expand a little bit on this question after I ask his, because there's a lot of, I have like seven cards here that touch on the same issue. Yuri Hollander asked, Yuri, do you mind just raising your hand? Um, what efforts are being made in Springfield to cut spending? Why is it, why is it always to tax more? Uh, other questions, similar questions have to do with um, uh, being on the record that taxes here aren't high enough, um, can you give me a reason why my son should move to Illinois? All you do is have more taxes than any other state. Um, since the pension payments in the state will never be solved, what is, what, what is the solution? Um, others are in disagreement with Governor Pritzker's plan about raising taxes, um, how this is going to affect a, a long-term solution when it's chasing people out of the state, um, and it goes on and on about taxes, so will IELTS taxes ever go down? Um, all right, so there's a lot of questions about taxes. So I'm going to move aside and let our elected officials talk, talk about taxes. It was, it was recommended to me that I go first. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is a very important question. Um, and people are not necessarily going to like the answer, right? Uh, people ask me about this, and I tell them, look, and they ask me about the state of Illinois. And, and the situation that we're in. We didn't get in this overnight. We're not gonna get out of it overnight, period, stop. Uh, and, uh, you know, as it relates to taxes, if you look at 
this previous session, um, there was four taxes or five taxes that were raised. Uh, none of them had to do with the budget, actually. The budget was bipartisan, um, and it did not raise taxes on um, individual taxpayers. Um, the capital bill, we uh, raised the gas tax. Um, the gas tax increase went to, uh, was 19 cents. I hadn't been raised since 1990, and the raise that we did puts us more in the middle of, of the country, what the rates are. Uh, and then the, the, the uh, that was a horizontal part of, of um, the capital bill, uh, roads, bridges, and mass transit. And then the vertical part, um, there was a few taxes that were raised um, like on e-cigarettes, cigarettes, and uh, parking, maybe, maybe another one. Um, I think that we have to understand the, um, the context here. One, uh, we, we talk about pensions. Um, this, is a, this is an issue that everyone kind of says, oh, we need pension reform, and then like when we get into more detail, no one knows what that really means. It's just a nice thing to say. I mean, you, you kind of add reform to anything, and it sounds nice. Uh, and so we have to acknowledge, one, that um, the protection of pensions or not reducing or diminishing it is in our constitution. Mm -hmm. Two, um, there was a significant period where uh, the legislature, before Representative Kalish and I were there, um, did not make their pension payment. What do we think is going to happen? You know, so people ask me, why should we believe you on the capital bill? I mean, I was knocking, I've knocked on doors and people still ask me about the lottery. Well, the capital bill, uh, there was a lockbox amendment in 2016. So there is dedicated revenue going. So anything we raise towards the capital bill will be going to roads, bridges, mass transit. Like it, it's, con it's completely locked out from anything else. Um, and so we didn't have that for pensions and we can discuss whether that's good policy overall or not. But the reality is for a significant amount of time for years, pension payments were not made. So obviously that adds up. And um, there is a plan. Ralph Martiri, the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, um, has a plan to get our pensions from 38% funded to 70% funded by 2045. Um, so yes, that's 2045. It is uh, 2019. 2019. Um, so it's, it's some time from now, but we have to start somewhere. We have to get this going. And keep in mind, you know, we talk about, uh, someone was talking about uh, us being freshmen. 51 out of the 177 legislators in the state legislature um, are new within the last two years. That's about 30%. Um, and so I think, look, all of us are willing to say, look, we weren't here when this problem started, but that doesn't matter because we're here now and we want to, we want to start fixing it. And um, as it relates to taxes, I think one, um, the fair tax is going to get a lot of discussion over the next year and a half. Uh, we passed the constitutional amendment. We have our rate structure. It would result in the rate structure that passed so that we let people know what we want to do should the constitutional amendment go into effect in November 2020. 97% um, of Illinois families would get uh, no tax increase or a tax cut. Um, and that would raise $3.4 billion. Now, you're going to hear a lot of rhetoric about where that's going to go. It's going to go to education, human services. I'm here to tell you. Uh, it doesn't sound enticing necessarily, but it's the right thing to say. That's going towards our pensions. That's going towards our backlog of bills. That's going towards improving our credit rating. That $3.4 billion, that's what I'm going to advocate for. And I think we saw a glimpse of that with the governor when we had a $1.5 billion um, extra from, from last year. He put that towards those items. So um, when we talk about the fair tax, it's not just we want to tax millionaires and billionaires. Um, you know, we, we, it's not just uh, the fact that we're only one of nine states that have a flat income tax. We need to do this. We need to do this because we need to improve our credit rating. We need to get rid of our um, um, backlog of bills that we're paying so much interest on. And, and um, we need to make our pension payment, double making our pension payment. Um, and so, um, yes, it's a tough conversation. And I can throw out the statistics, throw out the studies. You know, we all anecdotally hear about millionaires and billionaires leaving the state. But statistically, it's actually the lower uh, income folks that have um, left, left the state of Illinois. Uh, that's, that, those are data, that's data provided by nonpartisan organizations. Well, th so yes. And, and I think 
part of that is they can't afford to live here um, because of job availability or whatever the case may be. But property taxes, if you want to talk about taxes, I, I've knocked on 10,000 doors. I've never once heard about the income tax. I'll be honest with you, real honest. Soda tax, maybe once or twice. But income tax, soda tax, sales tax, it's always property tax. It's always property tax. So my belief is that if we reform our income tax code, and there's even discussions, and I don't know how people feel about broadening the sales tax base like, like Iowa, the state of Iowa has, um, we can actually address the property tax because that's the actual issue. Because it's true. That data is true. We In Cook County, and I'll stop because I'm going over my time. He probably wants me to keep talking. Uh, but the, the point is that we have Cook, the Cook County and Lake County have some of the highest property taxes in the, in the country. That's absolutely true. So, um, you know, what, and I, we just we meet with businesses all the time that this is what they talk about. So I think um, if we can address some of these other, because I'll be honest with you, we, we, you know, we can talk about cut spending, but we cut spending in 2011. We cut spending in 2017. And the last piece of spending is everyone says cut spending and then you say where, and then it's like, you know, people, people want to lose the microphone, you know, because every, you know, we don't want to cut spending for Medicaid. I don't want to cut spending for Medicaid. We don't want to cut spending from human services or education, you know. So, and, and it's not a simple answer. And I, we've done two rounds of cuts. Uh, and I think um, we can talk about that more. We, we should always talk about it, right? We should always be on the lookout for waste, fraud, and abuse. But the reality of the situation is we are, um, our, our, ta our income tax system in the state of Illinois is a, one of only nine in the country. and. We have we we have run it. We're running out of options, and we need to um, raise that revenue to get our fiscal house in order. You and I have talked about this, Alan. So, but but yeah, but but before before we get to that, I, you know, I'd like to share two uh, uh, two two stories on this issue because someone asked a question that was uh, for sure uh, you know uh, directed to me. So um, <clears throat> the first is. When I uh, started working in the legislature, uh, I understood really for the first time, you know, being an advocate or being a lobbyist and sitting in the gallery and trying to watch things go on on the floor, it's impossible. It's, it's really impossible to know until you're down there what's actually happening. Because you see all of us running around um, from the gallery and you really have no idea what's going on down there. Uh, What's, what's happening is that we're lobbying our own bills. In other words, everyone has their own bills, everyone has their own piece of legislation that they want to move forward. And we're talking to each other on the floor, say, hey, I have this bill coming up, you know, let me talk to you about it. And they talk about their bills, and we try to lobby each other on our bills, um, either they're coming up in committee or coming up on the floor. And I got to know uh, the Republicans uh, a lot more um, through this process, and the Republican spokesman on the House floor, it's interesting how that happens, you know, anytime a Democrat brings up a bill, so there's an individual from the op opposition party, the Republican party, whose job it is to uh, challenge every Democratic bill, right? So they, this is the uh, Republican spokesman. We have a Democratic, uh, you know, uh, uh, similar uh, position. So the Republican spokesman is a guy by the name of Mark Batnick, right? Mark Batnick, great guy. Uh, I debated him several times. Every one of my bills came up. Uh, except for one, uh, which he agreed with from the beginning. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I, debated, uh, I debated with him. And I went up to him one day, we were, you know, waiting around, or, you know, uh, there's a, a hullabaloo on the floor. And I said to him, hey, you had control of the state budget for four years, right? Like, from reality. In other words, like, let's, let's take away uh, the, the circus that was the, um, the budget stalemate. But the, the control that the Illinois governor has in the state is incredible, right? The, the power that a governor has in this state is incredible. And I said to him, so you had, you know, um, you had to control the budget for four years. Um, you didn't once, like I said, for real, like you didn't once propose anything less than what we're proposing. So like, where's all the talk about cutting, right? You should have, uh, submitted a, a, a budget that had all these cuts in it so that at least 
we could have that conversation. Yeah. And you know, he said to me, he said, you know, because there's nowhere to cut. He said, we're spending improperly. He says, we're contracting wrong, and we're not spending well. He said, but when it comes down to it, there's nowhere to cut. So I just want to put that out there. That's from the opposition. That's from the Republican. That's, that's from Mark Batnick. He'll go on the record as a YouTube. I suggest you watch it. Mark Batnick, I think it's B-A-I-T-N-I-C-K. Mark Batnick on YouTube gave a whole discussion about the Illinois state budget right, and what to do about it. I think it's worth watching because it can inform you from an insider's perspective from what we would call the opposition side, the way they're looking at how to reform uh, Illinois. It's, it's worth, I, I think it's an hour, it's, it's worth your time uh, to watch it if you're asking these questions. So that's, that's number one. Number two, um, there is a committee on the fair tax and um, you know, uh, at the time this committee happened, I wasn't probably gonna be challenged in the Democratic primary I am now. Uh, but uh, at that time, I was a pretty safe Democrat, and uh, they wanted safe Democrats uh, sitting on the committee so that when the fair tax passed, uh, the people who voted for it, um, you know, uh, uh, weren't going to be challenged. Now, I happen to be a very outspoken proponent uh, of passing this fair tax, uh, and um, the reason I was um, a very outspoken proponent of passing the fair tax. Uh, is because it is a ballot initiative that gives the people the right to vote yes or no. That is number one. That is why I'm a massive proponent. You make the decision. We have decided to give you that opportunity. You don't want the fair tax? Vote no. You want the fair tax? Vote yes. It's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, that is why I was a, a big proponent. Now, when it comes to the details on the rates, um, I happen to have a little argument. Now, people are, are hearing the second part of my statement where I say we don't go high enough, uh, but I also say we start too low. Uh, and I've said that over and over and over again. $250,000 is too low of an income, especially for the community that I come from, to start taxing people. Uh, even if it's a small tax, even if it's a minimal amount. I believe that 250 is too low, but I also believe um, that uh, based on what our projections are, um, on the higher level, if we are going to raise taxes, again, if it's going to happen, then if you're just capping it at 7.95 or 8%, it's not high enough um, because it doesn't accomplish the goals of those who are advocating for the tax increase because the numbers will end up in three to four years either necessitating another tax increase or something else is gonna be, have to be done between now and three to four years from now, which I believe is the governor's plan. I believe the governor's plan, because after having discussing with uh, you know, part of his team, I believe their plan is between now and three to four years from now, when what I described is going to happen, they will have come up with something um, that will not necessitate us to, uh, uh, to try to raise taxes again. So that's... Uh, okay. Um, I want, there are so many great questions over here. Um, in order to optimize, we're gonna do a lightning round. I'm gonna, I chose, the, I think, the three questions that, that appeared at least in some version more than once. Um, afterwards, if you want to, um, Representative Kalish will offer to stay for the rest of the day, so maybe take them up on the offer, but Senator Vilvalm as well is accessible, and I can pass on the questions after, or you can try to engage them yourself, um, and we're glad to follow up. So. Uh, we're going to try to limit the, the responses to one minute per question. One minute, per, um, not thir you don't have to split the minute. Um, but you could give your time like on the floor to the other. If you want. Yeah, okay. Um, you can yield your time. All right. So um, the, this question does not have a name on it. How will the upcoming legalization of cannabis for non-medical use affect this community? I yield my time to Representative. <laughs> <laughs> I. Um, that's a great question. So, I, I, the, in a way, I, I kind of talk about this issue is uh, um, we have three buttons. There are three buttons on our desk: green, red, and, and present. Um, there's no um, I like 70% of this and don't like 30% of this button. Uh, so we have to make a decision. Um, for those of you who don't know, and, and, and I want to echo the words of someone, we I'm more than happy to meet with people. Ali is my chief of staff in the back. Um, we can um, set up a meeting and talk. Um, I, I suppose this is what this is about, but we can set up another meeting and talk uh, about any of these issues. Um, 
the legalization of cannabis uh, was an important issue. It's, it's an issue that people think just kind of popped up. It's been worked on for a couple of years now by Senator Heather Staines and Representative Kelly Cassidy. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue where I look at what's happening around the country. Ten states um, have legalized uh, rec recreational cannabis by uh, referendum, by referendum, not even the legislature. Uh, and uh, we were heading in that direction. I think the state of Illinois, people, there's a lot of public support for it. Um, I think one, there's a couple things that the bill does. One, it expunges the records of people that um, had uh, minor possession and that, that are now caught in the um, criminal justice system, uh, which I think is important because if we're going to create a new industry, a new market in the state of Illinois where people are going to make billions of dollars, uh, we should at least try to help the people that were caught in the system who it's now harder for uh, to get a job, go to school, get a job, and, and succeed because um, a rising tide does lift all ships. Two, um, it um, makes sure that uh, we're uh, raising revenue for the state of Illinois. Uh, again, this is something that uh, we've seen in Colorado, California, Michigan, um, a variety of states uh, where they're able to, to um, effectively move this legislation forward into law, raise revenue from it. Uh, three, we, we, we had a lot of conversation about um, the concerns of people uh, in our communities. Um, and um, I think one, one of the two items I'll point to is um, there's 8% of the funding that's going to go towards law enforcement, ensuring that uh, they have the tools and training to deal with this. And 2% of the funding is going to go towards public awareness campaign, um, ensuring that um, our youth and uh, others understand the effects, understand um, who this is intended for and, and how to how to um, how it can be accessed uh, and so those are two important items that we got in look there's this legislation isn't perfect we have items to deal with for example um, even though 10 states have had this I was surprised to find out that there's no breathalyzer equivalent um, for um, cannabis so in other words when you get pulled over for drinking under the influence there's a field sobriety test and then there's a breathalyzer test there is a field sobriety test equivalent for um, cannabis. There isn't a breathalyzer test equivalent. Now, it was really frustrating to find out that this didn't exist. It may not be as big of a problem because we, if we was, we would have heard it from the other 10 states and probably um, um, had, a, had to have dealt with it on a bigger, bigger level here. Um, but it's still an issue for me because I want law enforcement to be able to have that tool. Uh, and so, um, like I said, th this is legislation that's not 100% that, that's not, um, perfect. We're going to have to go back, make tweaks, and, and, and talk about it. Uh, as far as it affecting our community, I think the way it was put, the way it was put together um, methodically, and um, by the way, there's 110 licenses that will be granted in January, um, and then 75 six months later, and then another 75 a year after that. So we'll have about 100, or 265 licenses within three years. Colorado, when they did it, they just did 1,300 licenses right off the bat. So that's what I'm talking about when pe people just kind of see headlines. But we really, they thought about this, we, we thought about it, and um, we, want, we wanted to do it methodically. Um, the state or the district or the state? The state, the state. So, um, and then obviously municipalities have the option to drop out as well, or opt out as well. Sorry? How many of the districts? Um, it's not done by district. Okay. It's, it's, it's not done by district. It's done by um, the state. Just a quick uh, anecdote on that one. Um, so uh, that vote happened on Chavez, and I wasn't pressing my button. So I, you know, I have no idea what I voted. I'm just uh, the uh, <laughs> the. Um, but interesting uh, as it relates to cannabis. So uh, I did vote yes on that uh, on that bill, um, and I'm happy to discuss that with uh, with everyone. But I think you know, like uh, like like Senator said, uh, my 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 focus is much more on the decriminalization uh, aspect of the bill, which I think uh, does good. Uh, I also did a lot of research myself. My sister, you know, very public uh, people know my sister, state legislator in Colorado. Um, and I talked to her about this, uh, this legislation. Uh, she felt this was a much better bill uh, than, uh, than what they have in uh, Colorado. And uh, that, uh, you know, as, as it relates to state policy, this was a good thing uh, uh, to get behind. So that's sort of what informed me uh, on, my, uh, on my vote on this one. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine the last two questions um, in the lightning round and try to get you out of here as soon as possible. Um, what is your position on gun control? And the second question essentially is um, the abortion bill, the RH, the Reproductive Health Act. Can you explain what it means um, to vote present? Um, I know that it's kind of like big issues for the lightning round combining <laughs> them, but. Uh, <laughs> This, this seems to be uh, directed at me, you know, Second Amendment, yay. Uh, uh, no, uh, so the uh, very, very interesting, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the first, um, uh, one of the first pieces of legislation that I, uh, that I introduced uh, received a, uh, a very warm welcome in this community. Uh, and uh, obviously we had, we had introduced, uh, uh, we had introduced a bad, uh, a bad bill. Um, and uh, because it did not, uh, it did not complete uh, the sentence uh, as we had introduced it. So yeah. So uh, while I'm, I'm in favor of common sense gun laws, uh, and I think that's uh, that's really uh, that's really important. Uh, common sense gun laws are, are important. I'm also in favor, um, you know, as it relates specifically uh, to our community, uh, that uh, you know, if uh, if you are going to carry. Uh, in this community, I'm, I'm a strong advocate that your rub or someone uh, in your shoal is aware uh, of the fact that you're carrying, uh, because uh, you know uh, otherwise uh, uh, you know uh, bad things can happen. So I'm 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 a I'm a strong advocate uh, of uh, like I said common sense. You know if you're carrying you know the law is if you're carrying a weapon you can't participate in kiddush club, right? You can't have a drink. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really important to, uh, to understand. Uh, that's common sense, but not everyone follows it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, those are, uh, those, are, those are uncomfortable conversations to have, and I'm, I've been having them with, uh, with some good groups uh, out here, and happy to continue having them. Um, voting present on the RHA, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with, uh, with anyone privately. Um, there were some good parts of the RHA. Uh, the Reproductive Health Act, uh, decriminalized uh, much of the 1975 uh, abortion bill. Uh, I think it's important. There was a, there are two articles written in the JTA recently, uh, one by a, a Chabad rabbi and one by uh, the Aguda spokesperson uh, on these uh, on these issues. Uh, and I think uh, it's important for everyone here to read the, uh, both of those articles uh, because it may inform you a little bit more uh, on an Orthodox Jewish person's approach to. Uh, to abortion in this country. We have to have a society where abortion is safe and legal um, because that allows us to follow uh, the dictates of the Torah. Um, and so, you know, going beyond that is, uh, is, is a question uh, that led me to my present vote. But, um, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a basic scale, right, society that we live in has to have abortion safe and legal. So that's important. Um, so I think I'll just I'll just talk, I'll just touch on uh, the gun violence prevention question. I think um, one of the things that I think it's hard for people to understand, um, and we need to do a better job of it um, in Springfield, is how much um, negotiations and compromise happen. Um, one, I guess, how much we do agree on. Um, I, I, I I would be hard pressed um, to tell you that um, about 80 to 80 to 90 percent of the bills that we pass in Springfield. Are bipartisan and almost unanimous. Uh, obviously, the 10 percent, the 20 percent, is what gets the attention uh, of the press and and, and others. Uh, like, for example, the RHA and, and, and gun control. Um, I think, when it, as it relates to compromise zone negotiations, it happens all the time. It's messy. It takes eight hours in a room with everybody until everyone wants to leave, and then they come to an agreement. Uh, and. Um, I just give that example because, or say that because the example that I would give is um, the Fix the Void Act, which is, uh, has passed the House and is awaiting a vote in the Senate. This is something that it's, it's, it's very um, uh, negotiated legislation with all the stakeholders. There's obviously people on, on, on both sides that are not happy, uh, but essentially it would kind of um, reform how, how folks um, have to get their FOID card and how often and how much of a fee they would have to pay. And this is a direct uh, result um, of what happened in Aurora. If, if that uh, person, if we were paying attention to his Floyd card, um, hope that might we might have had a different result there. Uh, and, and so um, we're, we're trying to, I think, 
when we talk about gun violence, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's happened in West Rogers Park, and it's happened in Skokie. Um, and as I say, before, as I said before, a rising tide lifts all ships. If, if we can, for example, with cannabis, get 700,000 people um, that are mainly in the south and west sides of Chicago, outside the criminal justice system, being able to go to school, um, get a job, um, what do we think is going to happen to gun violence? It's probably going to be reduced. And, and so, you know, that, that impacts us as well um, because obviously there's funding and whatnot that goes towards it. So um, I, I strongly believe that we need, like, like Representative Kaler said, common sense, gun violence prevention laws. And we can talk about that. That's, again, what I'm trying to get at is these conversations can be had and, um, you know, I think we're happy to have them. Yeah. I want to hear a loud round of applause. <laughs> Both the senator and the representative asked me, you know, how many people to expect. I said we're planning for between 25 and 40, and we have close to 70 people here today. So there is an interest, and uh, I'm grateful for all of you that made the sacrifice, whether it meant giving up softball or a bike trip, um, to be here. I, 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 I'm, you know, we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for them for making the sacrifice. And I think what you see from here today is, is that. Um, we, don't, we, we can't fetch or complain if we're not going to engage. And when you do engage, they're here to listen. And they really act upon what our concerns are and what our priorities are. Um, so I urge you all to continue to be, to, to, to be engaged, to share this with your friends, your family, because a community that is engaged is a community that's heard. Um, so thank you again for participating this morning. We, like to, we, we will be continuing these conversations. And thank you for attending. Thank you so much. Celebrate